Hi, morning. Sorry, I'm late. I want to pass over the club. Hi, hi. Justin, um, today is the OGC presentation. Could you please do an honor to quickly save introduction? Yes, once again, Marissa, I might pass that to you because you know Andrew better. Thank you for doing so. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Andrew Natanson is one of our uh, both uh, general neurology and uh, aging and dementia specialists here at OHSU. He joined uh, after his fellowship, I think about six years ago. He is a uh, celebrated educator who uh, is one of the uh, co-directors of the um, medical student uh, neurology clerkship. Um, so he is um, one of our most experienced and engaging speakers. So hopefully, um, this will be a, uh, I'm sure this will be an excellent lecture on, on updates in dementia, diagnostics and therapeutics. Thank you, Dr. Marisa, Dr. Andrew. Good morning. Welcome to BDMS. We are very eager to hear the update in dementia. Absolutely. Um, yes. Thank you. Okay. I guess I'll just go ahead and get started then. Um, all right. Well. I, I forgot to put it, but I do not have any financial disclosures. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about a couple of different brief overview of some dementia syndromes. What are some new diagnostic options that we have to try to help us make these diagnoses and what some of the limitations are? And then I'm going to be spending a fair amount of time talking about the brand new Alzheimer's treatments, as well as a, a new behavioral medicine that has just come to market. <clears throat> so briefly, we've changed how we define dementia over the years. We no longer require to have a memory component. Now there just needs to be an impairment in one or more cognitive domains, which is a decline from their prior level of function as well as their prior level of achievement. There needs to be some sort of objective marker as to what is wrong. This is usually done with some sort of cognitive test um, as well as some sort of functional impairment, which can either be measured with something like the clinician dementia rating scale, the CDR, or a functional assessment questionnaire like the FAQ. Um, we also tend to break down dementia categories into whether or not it's early onset versus late onset, and that has everything to do with whether or not symptoms started before or after the age of 65, and then we stage these things based on severity. Um, now, most commonly, we see Alzheimer's as the number one cause of dementia syndromes pretty much worldwide, and then followed that secondarily by vascular dementia, and then we get we clump Lewy body dementias, which includes both dementia with Lewy bodies as well as Parkinson's disease related dementias. And then the vast majority, the vast minority, excuse me, of all dementia syndromes are the frontotemporal lobar dementias, which make up about 1% of all cases over the age of 65. And this includes things like what we used to call PICS disease, which we now call behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, as well as several primary progressive aphasias and some of the Parkinson plus syndromes like progressive supranuclear palsy and cortical basal degeneration. Now, Alzheimer's disease, as we're all aware, includes both extracellular amyloid plaques and intracellular hyperphosphorylated tau tangles. We have the Alzheimer's amyloid model, and this is largely based on a lot of studies, including genetics, and we know that all the autosomal dominant genetics involve amyloid or amyloid processing or clearance of amyloid products as related to ApoE genetics. And with ApoE, E3 is the wild type. Patients who carry one or more copies of the E2 allele actually have reduced 
uh, incidence of Alzheimer's dementia, although do have a slightly increased risk of cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And patients that carry one or more copies of the E4 allele have an increased risk of developing Alzheimer's. And if you have more than one copy, it tends to be more severe and start at even earlier ages than if you just have one. A lot of work over the years has gone into producing this slide. Um, what we see here is basically time on the x-axis and on the y-axis is biomarkers. And previously, you know, prior to 2010, all of our work was basically focusing way out here on the right side of this graph where patients were already deeply in the throes of dementia. And what we've come to realize, looking at families with autosomal dominant genetics, as well as just studying more and more biomarkers over patients, is that in some of these families, sometimes more than 20 years before they can actually detect a cognitive symptom, and that's with detailed testing, not a screen, we can detect abnormal amyloid, either in spinal fluid or on amyloid PET imaging. And so this is the earliest marker, and it tells us that this is a disease that actually builds over years and decades before patients start to have symptoms. So we've just been focusing on the tip of the iceberg and missing everything else. Then about 10 years after amyloid deposits, we start to start, we then start to see hyperphosphorylation of tau and then tau clumping and aggregating and forming in the, the, the inclusions. So that's marked on this blue line here. Soon thereafter is when we start to see changes in structure of the brain, followed by some actual measurable memory impairments. And that's when you start to get into mild cognitive impairment when you have memory loss, but you still haven't lost functional status. And then finally you lose functional status and reach dementia clinically, right? And so this is really an important concept to think about as we start thinking about some of these new therapies that we're gonna talk about in terms of Alzheimer's. And a lot of the work that goes into this is also based on diagnostics. So we're gonna be reviewing a lot of that. Um, so this brings into this notion, the new framework that we have for discussing Alzheimer's. We're trying to move away from this being purely a clinical diagnosis and, and have this have more biomarker sort of positivity associated with it. So it's call, we're calling this the ATN model, A for amyloid, T for tau, and then N for neurodegeneration. The N is purposely put in parentheses because that is the least specific of the three. And this allows us to think about Alzheimer's disease as a continuum from preclinical, just having biomarkers, to mild cognitive impairment, and then dementia and all its different stages as we continue to go. Now we have a lot of different ways that we can verify different parts of this framework. We can detect abnormal amyloid with amyloid PET scans, with CSF analysis, and we're starting to get to the point where we can do this with blood tests as well. And I'm gonna talk about all three of those things in the next couple of slides. For tau, when we talk about tau and Alzheimer's, what we're really talking about is the hyperphosphorylated tau because that's more specific. And so we can measure that either in CSF with the phosphorylated tau biomarker. We can measure that with tau PET ligands that specifically bind to these different phosphorylated tau forms. Um, and now we're even starting to see some phosphorylated tau blood markers that we're gonna talk about a little bit later. And then neurodegeneration, which is much less specific and can be seen in other degenerative diseases. You can see abnormalities sometimes on structural MRI. If it's too subtle to see on structural MRI, you might be able to see it on FDG PET scan. Um, and then otherwise we can measure neurodegeneration with things like total tau and spinal fluid, or even looking at neurofilament light chain, both in spinal fluid and in plasma. Um, so this brings us to this continuum where if you are negative on everything, we're gonna say that you're normal. If you're positive for amyloid and either positive or negative for any of the other two, you're gonna be labeled as being on Alzheimer's continuum. Although if you have amyloid positive, tau negative, and neurodegeneration positive, that likely indicates that you have a co-pathology with something else going on, because it would be weird to have amyloid without tau and have neurodegeneration. Normally it goes in that order, at least that's the model. 
Whereas if you were amyloid negative and anything else was positive, that would be suggestive of some other degenerative process being the likely cause of your patient's symptoms. Now, part of the problem we run into is that amyloid is not just one thing. There's lots of different forms of amyloid that are throughout your brain, throughout your fluids. And so we have to think about these things. Amyloid gets cleaved into a bunch of different uh, sizes. The amyloid beta 40 is actually the most common and the normal sort of amyloid. Amyloid beta 42 is what tends to aggregate and then become insoluble eventually and form these plaques. But in order to get there, it has to sort of grow first into monomers, then into oligomers, then into these protofibrils, both small and then large, and then finally into the insoluble plaques. And so as a result of this, when we're talking about amyloid beta 42, when we start to see that number coming down in biomarkers in fluids, that's an indication that it's now become uh, insoluble and is actually in plaques. So when we see a lower amyloid beta 42, that's when we're having plaque formation. Now there's been some recent work that indicates that some of the more toxic amyloid, what might be more responsible for causing a lot of the pathological changes, might be some of these more soluble forms rather than the insoluble plaques, but that's still fairly hotly debated in the field. And so down below, I just show you some of the different sizes that they come in and sort of how this sort of all comes together into these clumps. Now, diagnostically, we've got a bunch of options. Probably the easiest thing to do, assuming it's available, your patient's love would be some sort of imaging modality, right? Everybody likes to not have needles put in them. Um, so the benefits of PET scans are that they're non-invasive and that they can increase your diagnostic accuracy. Some of the more overview of the challenges of some of these things, they are incredibly expensive and that's assuming they're even available in your area. Some of the tracers we use have to be formed the day of and then get delivered to your radiology suite and get used that day, otherwise they spoil. Um, so it can be quite challenging logistically if they're not available in your area and if they're not made locally. Um, on top of that, there's gonna be some radiation, right? So that's not a perfect test. There's no such thing as a perfect test. Now there's lots of different types of PET scans, unfortunately, so it does get a little convoluted. Um, What's most readily available is FDG PET scans. These have been around for a long time. They've been well validated in a variety of different diseases. And what this is really doing is you're giving a radioisotope of a fructose derivative, and then you're allowing your brain to take up more or less of that dye based on how metabolically active the regions of your brain are. And then based on lots and lots of studies, we've been able to put together this nice little diagram here showing you that you get these different regional patterns of hypometabolism that correlate with different disease states. For example, Alzheimer's disease, you tend to see the most hypometabolism within the parietal and the temporal lobes, which correlates well with where we see the pathology. Whereas with dementia with Lewy bodies, we actually tend to see a lot of hypometabolism within the occipital lobes. It can actually be quite challenging to differentiate dementia with Lewy bodies with posterior cortical atrophy, which is PCA, because that also tends to be largely occipital lobes. Luckily, your clinical exam is gonna help you between those two. Um, whereas with an FTD syndrome, we tend to see hypometabolism in the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes. And with cortical basal degeneration, we tend to get a really significant asymmetry where you only see hypometabolism on one hemisphere and not the other. Um, now, importantly, these are just diagnostic hints. Not one of these diagnoses can be made solely on this type of imaging modality. And these imaging modalities do not confirm any of the molecular mechanisms that we think about as we think about these diseases. The advantage of this study is if you don't know what your patient has, this one test might be able to push you more towards one of several different diagnostic syndromes that are related to dementia. Um, but if you're thinking about what can you do to then treat somebody molecularly, this doesn't satisfy that requirement. And that's gonna be important as we talk about these new uh, Alzheimer's therapies. Now, we do have some fancier versions of PET scans that are hopefully gonna start becoming something other than just research tools in the near future. One of the more promising ones is amyloid PET scans. 
there are multiple compounds that have been tested. All of them seem to be fairly equal in terms of their ability to discriminate between Alzheimer patients and negatives. Um, they all tend to correlate really well with amyloid within spinal fluid. And when we compare them to autopsy series data, they're really spectacular. They have something like a 96% sensitivity and 100% specificity. So this has really opened up the door for us studying these diseases in vivo before patients have died, because historically we've needed pathology and histology to confirm diagnoses. Um, now, one of the disadvantages to amyloid PET is you only learn about amyloid status. It doesn't tell you about tau status. And consequently, the correlation between amyloid PET positivity and risk of progression from MCI to Alzheimer's is only so-so. It's better than nothing. Um, it's better than just age and cognitive scores, but it 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 is really accentuated when you have some data about tau. Um, it's also really hard to interpret what positive amyloid means in a patient who doesn't have a memory abnormality. Is this somebody who's going to then develop Alzheimer's later? Is this a false positive? We don't have enough data to really tell people exactly what it means when all we know is you have positive amyloid and, and you're otherwise clinically normal. Um, another problem that we have is that all of these markers, when we use them for amyloid PET scans, they're not specific to Alzheimer's disease. They bind to other forms of amyloid in the brain, like cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And so you have to be careful in patients that have that diagnostic code. You know, is, is this really Alzheimer's disease or is it just abnormal amyloid in the brain due to some other condition? Now, tau PET studies are still for now purely just a research tool, whereas amyloid PET studies are probably going to start becoming commercially available in the next year if they're not already. Um, and what studies in the Alzheimer's disease initiative here have shown us is that tau PET studies, when people have positive tau studies, that has the highest correlation to when patients are going to suddenly start having memory problems, unlike amyloid PET scans. And not only that, but when tau becomes positive on PET, that's when we seem to see the highest potential for them to continue to decline cognitively. It actually seems to correlate where the higher the signal of these PET binders, the further progression you're seeing. And that's not something we see when we do amyloid PET studies. CSF is really the gold standard still, although we're moving more towards PET being the gold standard with some of these things. But the advantage of CSF is that we're not just checking one or the other when we're doing these tests. We actually look at amyloid, total tau and phosphorylated tau all at once. And so we get data about all three of those. And it's the combination of all three that gives us our highest sensitivity and specificities. This has been well documented in so many studies. I didn't even want to go over the data, but the data goes back over 20 years and really positively correlates. The problem you run into is just there's a lot of patients who don't really want to have a needle put in their back. And then you're also going to run into some complications where, you know, some patients might be on blood thinners and it's just not safe to do so. Some patients might have really severe spine disease and they might not be able to get a lumbar puncture safely. So there are some limitations in that as a study clinically. Um, but I've used this in my clinic a lot of times and I found it really, really helpful. It is commercially available so you can send it off to any number of labs and you can get those results fairly quickly. Um, if you do send it off, this is the kind of result that you can expect to see within a few weeks. You get both amyloid beta 42, and like I said, that should be low in somebody that has Alzheimer's because as it goes down, that's when you're forming the, the insoluble plaques. You tend to see elevations in total tau, and really that's just a marker of neuronal degeneration. It's not specific to Alzheimer's disease. You can see elevations in that in any of a number of degenerative disorders. And then they measure phosphorylated tau at 181. Um, 
And that is much more specific to Alzheimer's. You don't see elevations in PTAL 181 and other degenerative disorders. It, it, it's, it's unique to Alzheimer's. And so what you'd get is you get this nice little XY graph. And on the X axis, they put phosphorylated tau. And so patients that have Alzheimer's, you'd expect that to be high. And then on the Y axis, they actually have the amyloid tau index, which is the amyloid beta 42 over the total tau. And so what you see is patients like mine here with that red X in that bottom right hand corner, um, patients that have Alzheimer's are going to fall into that bottom right hand quadrant of this graph. Patients who do not have Alzheimer's are going to fall in that top left hand quadrant of that graph. And patients who fall anywhere else are confusing and probably need some other sort of test before you tell them what's going on. Um, but this is a fairly simple thing and can be really helpful when you're trying to delineate what somebody might have and what therapies you might be able to offer them. Now, what's the easiest thing, of course, for most people is some blood testing. And so we're starting to get into the era where this is going to become more important and more readily available. There's already a commercially available test for amyloid beta 42 over amyloid beta 40. And what the studies previously done is shown that either one of those by itself is all not all that helpful and doesn't tend to correlate well with symptoms. But when you take the ratio of 42 over 40, you get a high correlation with amyloid PET status, as well as with cerebral spinal fluid phosphorylated tau, greater than 85%. Um, the accuracy that goes up if you also know the patient's APOE status. In particular, if they have one or more copies of the APOE4 gene and they have an elevation in the amyloid beta 4240 ratio, you're going to see that's much more likely to correlate with actual disease. Um, now, that being said, there are patients who can have negative amyloid PET scans and positive serum markers, which is a little bit hard to think about. And at least in this one study, in that population of patients, you actually found that they had a, uh, a significantly increased risk over 15 fold of them progressing to a positive amyloid PET scan uh, within a year. So that it's interesting, but again, it doesn't always correlate and you are, in my own hands, when I've done this study in patients that I thought for sure was going to be negative, I've had multiple people end up having a positive result, and then I've then done a confirmatory test with either amyloid PET or CSF analysis, and they've been negative. So I've gotten several false positives with this amyloid serum marker. Um, but the negative predictive value of this test is thought to be fairly high, and it might be really useful to start screening patients that you think might have mild cognitive impairment and are thinking about maybe some of these new amyloid therapies. Now, the more interesting tests are the phosphorylated tau tests, and they've looked at a couple of different forms of that over the years. The first one that was really sort of looked at was the, was the PTAL-181, and this correlates with the same marker that we look at in spinal fluid. And when we've looked at this, comparing both cognitively normal to MCI patients to Alzheimer's disease patients as clinically diagnosed with probable AD, it's correlated pretty well with amyloid PET positivity. And that's how we tend to measure these things now is we, we know that PET works really well with actual pathology. And so now we measure everything as opposed to PET. Um, but there are some cases where it's not super accurate. PTAU217 seems to have even better data. Um, this correlated really tightly with both neuropathology confirmed Alzheimer's disease, even better than the PTAU181. Um, and it was really strongly able to, to discriminate other neurodegenerative processes from Alzheimer's disease in a very large group of studies. Um, so this is not yet commercially available, but a lot of the new clinical trials that are being done in Alzheimer's are actually using PTAU217 
as a confirmatory test before they're even enrolling patients. So I'm pretty sure this is going to be the future when it does come commercially available. There are a couple of other things that we're looking at. One that's really interesting is neurofilament light chain. This has been looked at in both serum and CSF, and of course, everybody's going to prefer a serum study. And what we're finding is that this can be elevated in a variety of neurodegenerative processes, both FTD as well as AD and even Lewy body. Um, but what you're not seeing is positivity in cognitively normal patients. And so this is something that you might be able to use if you're trying to really screen out patients like, hey, do you have a neurodegenerative process or is this something else? And if it's negative, then maybe they have a vascular cause of their dementia, or maybe they have a psychiatric cause of their cognitive symptoms. Um, and interestingly enough, this has been able to discriminate between MCI and even dementia, where it seems to get a little bit higher. And that's the, the data that I'm showing you in the bottom right hand corner. Um, now, it is not able to distinguish between FTD and AD. Um, in fact, it tends to be a lot higher in FTD than in AD, but it, the ability to distinguish between those two disorders based on this level is, is not there yet. Now, for Lewy body disease, we've got a couple of other things. First and foremost, we updated the diagnostic criteria a few years ago. And so for those of you who aren't aware, one of the big things is that we now have four core criteria with REM behavior disorder being the new addition. Um, this is based off a bunch of studies that have come out the last couple of years. One being that REM behavior disorder is seen in over three quarters of all patients with dementia with Lewy bodies. And two being that when you follow patients that had theoretically idiopathic REM behavior disorder longitudinally over time, over 90% of them developed a neurodegenerative process, the most common of which was some form of alpha-synuclein disorder. Um, and so we've got a couple of biomarkers now that we're looking at and are also potentially in the future for Lewy body disease. And of course, uh, a dopamine uptake scan is already readily available. It can help us delineate these types of disorders from non-alpha-synuclein disorders. Um, although DAT scans can be positive in other sort of Parkinson plus syndromes like progressive subnuclear palsy. Um, but due to all these studies with REM behavior disorder, we now know that you can actually get a sleep study. And if you can document atonia during REM, that's now a biomarker for Lewy body disease. Um, and that can increase your, your diagnostic accuracy. Older studies show that we can use these cardiac MIBG scans, and those tend to correlate when patients have a lot of dysautonomia symptoms, and that's also still considered an indicative biomarker for Lewy body disease. New things that are starting to come out that are showing a lot of promise include RT quick assays to look at alpha-synuclein aggregation. And so they've looked at that both in skin biopsies, and that's shown pretty high sensitivity and specificity, as well as in CSF. Um, and so in the near future, you might be able to do a lumbar puncture on a patient and test them for both Alzheimer's markers and Lewy body markers and get a sense of what's going on with a single test, which would be really useful. Um, now, interestingly, when we talk about skin biopsies, it seems to be that the closer to the brain you take the skin, the more accurate it is. Um, where skin biopsies taken from the high cervical spine had a really high sensitivity and specificity, um, and you could sometimes miss things in early stages if you took something from a patient's thigh. Um, so these are the new Lewy body diagnostics. I didn't really get much into FTD diagnostics, but the neurofilament light chain would be another one of those that we could get into. Switching gears a little bit, let's talk about therapeutics and with a real focus on Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we've done a lot of things looking at monoclonal antibodies that try to target various forms of amyloid. Um, and so like the first generation that we tried, none of them really worked. Um, and largely these targeted various forms of amyloid. Some of them targeted all the forms, some of them just sort of the soluble monomeric forms, and others more monomers and oligomers. And, and these were neither effective at biomarkers nor clinically. 
Um, as we sort of refine the process, we've started to have some breakthroughs. Um, so sort of the second generation of uh, monoclonal antibodies include things like donatumab, which actually just published results in July of this year and, and shows some positive results, and I'll show you those in a bit. Um, Gantanerumab, um, this shows that it can clear amyloid based on biomarkers, uh, but has had really no significant impact clinically. Um, aducanumab, which was in the news a lot in this country, um, largely due to some negative press, um, which again shows that it can clear biomarkers quite effectively, but it did not appear to have much, if any, clinical impact on patients over the course of, of 18 months. And then lecanemab, which has recently gotten full approval from our regulatory body here, the FDA, um, and which targets soluble aggregates of both oligomers and the protofibrils. In fact, one reason why it's thought that lecanemab has worked and maybe some of the others have not has to do with the fact of how well lecanemab binds to these protofibrils. It has the tightest binding to protofibrils than any other monoclonal antibody tested to date. And it's thought that maybe those protofibrils are largely responsible for some of the toxicity that we see. But again, that's debatable. Um, and so lecanemab was just in a large phase three study. Um, it involved over 250 sites worldwide, um, largely in America and in Europe, but with centers in Singapore and China and Japan and Korea. There was nothing in Thailand, I'm sorry. Um, we also don't have any data from any countries in South America or in Africa. Um, in this study, we included patients who were aged 50 to 90. They had to have at least mild cognitive impairment or mild dementia as measured by a CDR from 0 0.5 to 1. They needed to have biomarker confirmation of amyloid, and that was either with CSF or with an amyloid PET scan. They needed to have some abnormal memory test. And if they were taking sort of standard therapy for dementia, they had to have been stable on those drugs for at least three months. There was a lot of exclusion criteria, and this is one of the problems with this drug and all of these drugs is that they were excluded pretty much anybody with any other significant medical problem. Um, if patients have had a TIA or a seizure or a stroke within the last year, they were excluded. If they had any other significant neurological disease, they were excluded. If they had significant geriatric symptoms, they were excluded, and that could be measured with a geriatric depression scale. If they couldn't have MRIs for whatever reason, they were excluded. If they'd had multiple infarcts or severe white matter disease, they were excluded. If they had significant bleeding or risk of bleeding intracerebrally, they were excluded. Um, and then if they were on any sort of immune modulating agents, they were excluded. Um, or if they had any other unstable medical condition, right? So it was basically really hard to be in this study. Um, that being said, we screened almost 6,000 people. Over 4,000 got screened out because we had such stringent criteria. Um, but we had almost eight, like 19, 1,800 people enroll in this study. Um, so about 900 people got randomized to placebo and about 900 people got randomized to treatment. We tried to stratify these based on MCI versus mild dementia, whether or not they were taking drugs and what their APOE genetic background was. And then some of these patients went on to do a longitudinal amyloid PET study, others did a longitudinal tau PET study, and yet others did a longitudinal spinal fluid analysis. And so our primary endpoints for this were what happened to the CDR at 18 months? And then we had multiple secondary endpoints, including what did we see in terms of amyloid biomarkers? What did we see on cognitive testing? That's the ADOS COG. The AD COMS is a composite score using a variety of cognitive tests as well as the CDR, and that's been well validated looking at early uh, progression of dementia and Alzheimer's disease. And then we also used a, um, a questionnaire measuring IADLs, 
Um, and again, higher is actually better with that. Um, and so what the results that were published in this phase three study showed was that, yes, this monoclonal antibody drastically reduces the amount of amyloid that we can detect in patients' brains. Um, but more to the point, it could also reduce the worsening in cognition over time. Now, importantly, they did still get worse over time, but they got worse more slowly than the placebo arm. Um, we see this as well in the composite score and as well as in their functional abilities. And there was actually a, a two point difference in functional abilities, which I think is clinically meaningful. Um, what I like even better is what they show in the supplemental figures. This is the first data that I'm aware of that can confirm in a human subject that impacting amyloid can subsequently impact tau. And so we see that in spinal fluid, patients who got drug as opposed to placebo had a reduction at, from their baseline to treatment in total tau. So they have less neuronal degeneration going on anymore. We see a reduction in the phosphorylated tau in spinal fluid. So this is having a direct impact of a downstream biomarker by decreasing amyloid. Um, and we can even see this in phosphorylated tau in the serum. And so this is really pretty exciting from my perspective that here we have something that's impacting not just one biomarker, but downstream biomarkers. Functionally, patients who are on this therapy, you could actually see a widening in terms of their risk of progression to the next stage over time, where early on it was fairly narrow, but as time went on, it got wider and wider and wider. And so what this data is really telling me is that this drug is the first drug that's ever been published that seems to actually apply the brakes to the Alzheimer's train. The train's still moving, patients are still getting worse, but they're, they're getting worse more slowly and it, the amount that's slowing down seems to be increasing over time. When we look at some subset analysis, we can further pick and choose what we think is really important here. And one of the hallmarks that I really want to point out is that when we look at genetic analysis, if we actually excluded the patients that were homozygous for APOE4, these were the patients that were actually weighing down some of the results. They didn't really benefit. Whereas patients who were either heterozygous or non-carriers, instead of a 27% slowing for all comers, we're seeing somewhere between a 30 and a 40% slowing down. Um, likewise, when we look at age, we see that younger patients didn't do as well as older patients. And this actually correlates very, very well with APOE status, where patients that have two copies tend to be much younger than patients with one copy or no copies. Um, there are some gender discrepancies. And this is something that we see among a lot of dementia literature and is not super surprising. Um, most cognitive tests that we give to patients tend to in, give women an unfair advantage. They score higher than men, even though they might be further along in actual pathology. And that might explain some of this findings, but maybe there's something else that we don't know, more to be determined. Um, and then not unsurprisingly, we did see some um, racial discrepancies. Um, Part of this is a numbers game. There were only 40 something patients who identified as being black. Uh, the vast majority of patients identified as being uh, white, but we did have a fair amount of patients who were of Asian descent. Again, not Thai, but from China, from Japan, from Korea. Um, and at least among those patients, we did also see some significant slowing down of the disease. It's not a great drug. There are definitely some risks that come with it, and that's what we're going to go over now. Um, only 6% of people actually dropped out of the study due to adverse events. And so it, it was generally fairly well tolerated. Um, there were equal number of deaths in the treatment arm as in the placebo arm, at least statistically. Um, the thing that seemed to prop up the most in patients who were given therapy was an infusion reaction. 
and this occurred in about one in four people. If this occurred, it occurred the first time patients got drugs and every subsequent time. If it didn't happen the first time, it almost never occurred. Um, the most common symptoms were either swelling in the arm as the drug was going in, or maybe a flu-like response that might occur up to a day later. It was very, very rare to have any sort of um, significant angioedema, but there were a few patients where that occurred and they required some epinephrine. Largely what we realized is once patients got this, we could pretreat them with either antihistamines or corticosteroids and have some epinephrine on hand just in case, and patients were able to do better. And as that happened, those symptoms got less over time. Um, the other common side effect was headache, and that occurred in about 11% of people on drug and only about 8% of people were on placebo. Otherwise, it was fairly well tolerated other than this brand new side effect called aria, and so I'm going to spend a bit of time talking about that. So aria is an acronym. It stands for Amyloid Related Imaging Abnormality, and it comes in two big flavors. Um, aria E, where the E stands for edema, or aria H, where the H stands for either hemosiderin or hemorrhage, depending on where you're coming from. Um, and so this is what it looks like radiographically. And typically, if we see aria H, we actually see co-pathology with aria E. It's rare to see aria H in isolation. Um, but this is essentially what we can see. And when we try to delve more into this, what we know is that aria E is vasogenic edema. It's probably quite similar to this other entity that we already know about called PRESS. The symptoms are usually none. That's why we call this an imaging abnormality. But in, a, in rare circumstances, patients could have some symptoms and they were usually mild. Um, so only 3% of all people treated with this drug had any symptoms with aria. Um, and less than 1% of those were serious. Um, and over 80% of patients that had developed a symptom with aria actually resolved spontaneously without doing anything other than holding therapy for a month or two. Um, now, aria H most commonly was a was a microbleed, less than one centimeter, and could range in terms of the number from less than four to more than ten, um, and that gave you a severity scale. Um, you could also get superficial siderosis, and very infrequently you can get something more than a microbleed. There were something like six people that had a bleed larger than a centimeter in the study, and the vast majority of those occurred in patients who were on anticoagulation. Um, now, like I said, most of the time these are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic, but there are some rare complications. You can have a large bleed. You could develop seizures or status epilepticus. There were three deaths that we could say definitively came from this therapy, and all three of those were either on anticoagulation or got TPA because they had a heart attack, and then they had a big intracerebral hemorrhage and died. Um, so the risk of uh, adverse event goes up for patients who are on anticoagulation. I don't yet have subset data for antiplatelet agents, but they were allowed in the phase three study as were patients on anticoagulation. And uh, the pharmaceutical reps have actually assured me that, that they're gonna get me that data soon. I just, I don't have it yet. Um, for this reason, anybody that gets started on these therapies needs to get monitored with routine MRIs. And this was how we did it in the study and how it's being recommended based at least by our regulatory body you get an MRI prior to starting therapy. It has to be less than a year old. And then you get three more MRIs, one before the fifth infusion, one before the seventh infusion, and one before the 14th infusion. Now, the risk of aria also depended on APOE status, where, interestingly enough, we saw a few cases of this even in patients getting the placebo. And not a lot with aria E, but a, a, a few. And so this is actually indicative that this is something that happens to people who have Alzheimer's disease. 
And before we started to do studies and checking MRIs on people regularly, we just were missing this. Um, but what we can see is that if you're a non-carrier, your risk of aria of symptomatic aria e is less than one and a half percent. Whereas if you're a carrier, the risk is about three percent, and if you're homozygous, the risk is nine percent. Um, and that's for symptoms. For just having aria, again, the risk is linked to your genetic background. If you have ApoE homozygous, the risk is about 30%, whereas if you're a non-carrier, the risk is five. Um, so this is the first drug that I'm aware of where your genetic background is actually gonna be really important in terms of efficacy and safety. And so we're gonna need to start testing genetics in a lot of our patients if we wanna think about these therapies. Uh, likewise, we saw a similar effect with ARIA-H, where the risk really went up in patients who were homozygous for E4, E4. Um, now, we saw a lot more ARIA-H even in patients on placebo, um, but the risk did go up no matter what their genetic background was if you were on therapy as opposed to placebo. Now, ARIA-E tended to occur within the first three months of therapy and not afterwards. ARIA-H could actually occur at any time that patients were on therapy. And that's, so that's a little scarier. Uh, but luckily it was a lot rarer and symptoms from ARIA-H are really infrequent. Um, now, if people get ARIA, it sort of depends on whether or not they have symptoms, what type of ARIA it is, and how severe the symptoms and the radiographic findings are. If they're asymptomatic and radiographically it's mild, you can keep giving therapy. If they're symptomatic or if the radiographic findings are more than mild, you'll probably need to suspend therapy. And then the recommendations are gonna to be to repeat an MRI in somewhere the next two to four months. And if symptoms have resolved and the radiographic findings have improved, you might then be able to resume therapy, but it's gonna be up to the discretion of the prescriber. There are a lot of caveats with this therapy. For one, and probably the biggest is, what is the long-term data? So far, we have very limited numbers. We've followed patients for 18 months. Over 18 months, it seems to slow down the disease and be fairly well tolerated for most people. But what happens after that? And, and does it continue to slow down? Does it speed up again later? Do we need to keep giving the therapy? Are there any long-term sequelae? We don't know yet. So there's a lot of concerns. One of those concerns is brain atrophy. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. As I mentioned earlier, another concern is how well does this drug work in patients not studied, like patients who identify as black. And ideally, as we start to get more patients who are of various Asian ancestries, um, and elsewhere and other populations. So we, we, we have a lot more data that we need to collect before we know and we can really tell our patients what to expect. Um, it's gonna be a really slow rollout for this drug. It's incredibly inconvenient. You need to have IV infusions every two weeks. You need to have all these confirmatory tests. You need to have access to MRIs. It's incredibly challenging for us to get up and running. I, don't know how doctors in other countries that don't have all these things available to them are gonna be able to get this to actively work, but this is gonna be the future. Um, and then the costs of these medicines and these tests are also gonna be considerable. And how does that play a role in all these things? Uh, and from a personal note, what about the patients that are more than mild or the patients who are homozygous E4, how do we, tell them, no, you can't have this. Um, it's a little hard for me to do that, and I'm still working on that personally. Um, but brain atrophy is a concern. And so there was a meta-analysis that was done and just published this summer showing that anybody who was given any of these monoclonal antibodies seemed to develop brain atrophy at rates higher than would be expected. Um, Interestingly, this seemed to really correlate to when patients developed ARIA. And so if you look at the very bottom of this slide, what you're showing is that if you didn't have ARIA, you actually didn't 
get this brain atrophy. But if you did have aria and you were given one of these drugs, you did see atrophy within, uh, as, as measured by an enlargement of the ventricles by about two milliliters. Um, they looked at other brain areas when they did this analysis, and what they found was that there, there wasn't a correlation at all with these drugs and hippocampal atrophy. So that's kind of interesting, considering that's where Alzheimer's tends to like to play. Um, but there was an effect on whole volume loss that also correlated with whether or not there was aria, um, and that was about 5%. We don't know why this happens. We don't know what this means. We don't know if this has any clinical bearing. Right now, this is just a radiographic finding that's been validated in a bunch of things. Now, there's new drugs that are hitting them, going to be hitting the market soon. And so Donanumab recently just got published um, in the Journal of American Medical Association. And so this was actually very, very similar to the results we see with Lucanumab. Um, it seemed to slow down progression by about a third as measured by 18 months in the clinical dementia rating scale. It had very similar impacts on all of the biomarkers described, including amyloid, tau, and phosphorylated tau. It did have slightly higher risks of aria compared to lecanemab, which had risks somewhere between 10 and 15%. This had risks somewhere between 20 and 24%. And just like with lecanemab, those risks were higher in patients who were homozygous E4. Um, it had less of an infusion reaction, only 9%, as opposed to 26% with lecanemab. And one of the main advantages that this drug is going to have is instead of every two-week infusions, you only need infusions every four weeks. So half the amount of time you have to spend in an infusion center getting the drug. The other interesting thing about this paper and this drug is that when they were designing the study, they set it up so that when patients re reached a certain threshold in amyloid detectivity, where basically it dropped below detectable levels, they swapped the patients from drug to placebo. And so based on that, there's this notion that if you treat with these anti-amyloid therapies and you wipe out the 20 plus years of amyloid building and accumulating, you might be able to then take a pause before amyloid builds up to such a level that it then accelerates the worsening cognition. But again, a lot more data needs to come out before we can say that with any definitive authority, but it's an interesting notion. And so that you might be able to treat patients with these types of disorders for a period of time, take a break, and then may or may not have to revisit it again in the future. Um, so there's a bunch of things that we're hoping to do in the future based on some of these results. One of which is we're recruiting patients to see, can lecanemab be given to patients early enough, i.e. in patients that have biomarkers, but no cognitive symptoms? Can we prevent them from getting cognitive symptoms in the first place? And so that's a study that we're actually actively recruiting patients for here at OHSU. Another thing that's being done by the drug manufacturer is they're trying to determine if they can modify this monoclonal antibody to be delivered in a subcutaneous pen injector. And the answer is, short answer is probably, um, we just don't know how effective it is or how safe it is yet. So those studies are actually ongoing and we should have some more results about that in a few more years. And assuming that works, that's going to open up a lot more doors to people getting this therapy because it'll be a lot more available and um, a lot less burdensome on patients. They won't have to travel. They won't have to do a lot of things. Um, so in my mind, this is a lot like how multiple sclerosis looked 40 years ago before the advent of beta interferon and then followed by something like clotiromere acetate, right? And so I, I think we're going to start to head down that trajectory in dementia now. Um, on a completely unrelated note, there is a new agitation medicine that has been getting some notice. Uh, this is brexapiprazole. It's a new antipsychotic, and it's got both dopamine and serotonin partial agonism. Um, 
in about three studies combined here, it has a mild impact on uh, agitation as measured by a behavioral index. Um, its main advantage is its safety and tolerability. Um, it had very few side effects compared to a placebo. Only about 8% of patients became somnolent. Only about 5% of patients became dizzy. It had minimal impact on, um, on uh, cardiac function. It did not significantly prolong the QTC. Um, and it had minimal extrapyramidal symptoms. So high tolerability and safety questionable efficacy and it being new and incredibly expensive compared to some of the older atypical antipsychotics. Um, in my own clinical practice, I have not started to use this agent. I'm falling back on still atypical antipsychotics like ketiapine, like aripiprazole, um, like olanzapine. Um, but there, there are new agents that are coming out and this is actually the only one, at least in America, where there is FDA approval specifically for agitation and dementia. None of the others have that as a as a label. And with that, I'm going to stop and see if you guys have any questions. So thank you. Thank you very much. I have learned a lot of exciting treatment for dementia today, and uh, there's a hope. Uh, this talk for future dementia patient. Any question for him? We have a few minutes. Yes, Q, me and Meha. Dr. Andrew, let me ask the, the, a simple question. Uh, you, you talk about amyloid in uh, amyloid plaque in the uh, asthma disease. Any correlation with the CAA? I, I mean, the patient have the amyloid angiopathy have breathing in the brain. And then from uh, any test, we, we check that they have amyloid in the brain. Do you think that uh, CAA and Alzheimer's disease is uh, the same category of disease? So they're not the same, but there is, there is a lot of overlap. A lot of patients that have Alzheimer's also have CAA, um, but you, you can have one and not the other, or you can have both. So they, they, there seems to be overlap. And the way I think about it is if you have one disease in which you have abnormal amyloid de deposits, the chances of you having a second disease with abnormal amyloid is probably higher than in somebody without either one of those. Um, and, and we see that both as well in the genetic analysis where patients that have that APOE2 gene, which is very rare, they actually have an increased risk of cerebral amyloid angiopathy as opposed to wild type patients, but they have a decreased risk of Alzheimer's disease. Thank, Thank you. You can have one last question, please. Chief Tamita. <laughs> Thank you very much for your intensive lecture about Alzheimer's disease. I'm Dr. Bishar Kisangong. Actually, I'm a movement disorder specialist. I would like to know for your lecture, and I'm not sure for the screening for the people who have tendency to have uh, cognitive impairment. I know at which age uh, should we test the patient for pre preclinical diagnosis, just just to make sure that you know patients. Some patients they worry about you know they're gonna got, get Alzheimer. They come in like thirty years old, forty years old, but right? suddenly they say like fifty years old. Right? But I'm not sure can we do it earlier. Well, and, and that's something that we're, we're trying to look at right now. Um, you know, so we're, we're, we're trying to find patients who are 50 and older that have biomarkers but don't, don't have any memory symptoms yet. Um, and I would have thought that would be hard to do, but we're finding lots of patients. Um, what I suspect, you know, based on the biomarker data is that you know, testing somebody at about the age 60 is probably a pretty valid approach because, again, we, we seem to see that Alzheimer's takes somewhere between 10 and 20 years to build up to a level where it seems to cause pathology. And so if we're testing people around that age, we're going to catch a lot of people who develop it 
in their 70s, maybe even in their early 80s. Um, and so what, what I keep jokingly telling people is that I, I envision a world where we turn 60 and we get a screening colonoscopy followed by a screening lumbar puncture. Um, and if we're positive, we get shuffled onto these therapies. Yeah. That's Actually, the here at Bangkok Hospital, we have a uh, ability to perform like a PIP scan, the mm. pit amyloid test, but still we, we cannot do the tau test yet. Though. But that's one center in Bangkok, uh, they can perform the tau test scan. So I'm still wondering, you know, I send a patient to do the pit amyloid test, uh, with the dementia patient, and they we couldn't find the beta amyloid in the brain. Should we send the patient for the tau scan, or you know, if the well, beta amyloid is negative, then the tau should be negative also, right? If, yeah. if the beta if the beta amyloid is negative and the tau is positive, then that would suggest a pathology other than Alzheimer's disease, based on the new models the, the new models that we're using. Um, and there are patients that have positive tau and negative amyloid, and that's exactly what they would fall into. Um, Thank you. We have reached the end of the day, and we are thankful for Dr. Andrew for a very, very excellent lecture and open our eyes to the new hope for dementia. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having Thank me. Uh, Thanks, Andrew. Thank Great you. job. Thank you so much. Bye, bye everybody. Bye, Marissa. Thank you, Dr. Andrew.